Hello, welcome to Emotional Badass, where Moxie meets Mindful. I'm Nikki Eisenhower, your host, life coach, and psychotherapist. And on today's episode, I am exploring our highly sensitive similarities. As highly sensitive people, as we're figuring that out, we tend to grieve not being like other people because we've held this expectation that we should be like other people. Figuring out that we're highly sensitive opens up a whole new world of what it is to accept ourselves, to get to know ourselves. The final stage of a grieving process is acceptance. And this acceptance of who we are, of the gifts we were born with, of the seeking that calls us. This acceptance allows us to work with ourselves versus fight or shame ourselves for not being other than how we are. I was trying to figure out how many hours I've spent with clients over the years since I began my therapy career, and it's more than 25,000 direct face-to-face client hours. That means with my super observational parts, I have noticed some patterns, some trends, some traits. And as different as we all are, we do have a lot in common. And if you're new to figuring out that you're highly sensitive, this is going to be a really fun list for you to hear. If you've been figuring this out for a while, this is going to be a really great review and maybe a reminder of what your actual highly sensitive traits are. I wonder how many off of this list, I have a list of 23, but they overlap. They're not mutually exclusive, but I wonder how many of these similarities will resonate with each of you. I hope by hearing it all put together in this list, because you certainly hear me mention these things all the time if you're a listener of the show or if you work with me, but I hope hearing it all put together in a big long list helps you accept more of your true self, your high sensitivity in a way that is loving, respectful, and grounded. And these are in no particular order. All right, number one, high conscientiousness. Now, this floored me. A million years ago in a session, Lisa, my healer, said to me, Nikki, you're overly conscientious. And the fact that that the words overly and conscientious came together about made my mind explode. Coming from a Southern Louisiana culture of really priding conscientiousness, uh, warmth, hospitality, bringing people into your home, I had never ever considered that I could be too conscientious. I didn't think there was an amount of conscientiousness that could be too much. And I've learned over the years that this is a very, very common trait. And this makes sense, right? Because if we're highly sensitive and we can really sense what's going on with other people, then we want to make them feel good. We want to be conscientious to their needs and their desires. So I think it's very easy to understand why we might be born with this propensity to be conscientious. And then as we move through the world, learn to be overly conscientious, often at our detriment. So in some ways, healing and stepping into our personal power and personal responsibility may be about learning how to be conscientious in a way that doesn't screw ourselves over or drain us. All right, number two, work ethic. I meet more highly sensitive people with a super strong work ethic than I do otherwise. So many of my clients over the years show up with such hard work. It's why a lot of us have an entrepreneurial spirit. And we don't just stay with that being a spirit. Many of us walk this path of figuring out either a side income, some kind of side hustle, some kind of side gig, or we grow our own businesses. A lot of those businesses being a service-based business. And if we're highly conscientious, like I mentioned a moment ago, that's really going to serve us in the customer service department. So we tend to have a really strong work ethic. I think that's also because we can feel how frustrating it is 
for any of our bosses, even in some of our first positions that we might work as a teenager in our early 20s, we can feel the struggle of some of our managers to have good help. And so we want to be good help for them to not stress them out too. And that leads me to number three, people pleasing and codependency. That's certainly a theme here on Emotional Badass. Many of us that come from a trauma background learn to people please. It's how we found our place in the world, how we felt accepted and enveloped by other people. We didn't want to piss them off so that they would send us away. So we learned to please people. And that, of course, is a beautiful, beautiful part of who we are, how we move through the world, how we relate. When it starts to be dysfunctional codependency is when we're giving so much patience and pleasing to others that we forget that it's part of our job to also please ourselves, to love ourselves, to show up for ourselves in a way that is healthily independent instead of getting most, if not all, of our good feelings through showing up for others. And that's where it starts to be dysfunctionally codependent. So as a tribe, many of us work on this. Four, I call it the overs and the unders. As highly sensitive people, we tend to experience a lot of overwhelm, a lot of overstimulation, overthinking, or overexplaining. And when we hit a certain point of being done, I can't do it anymore, we often say, screw it. And then we understimulate ourselves. We melt into sofas. We Netflix to try to restore. It's a big swing from overstimulation to understimulation, from overthinking to I just can't think anymore. Sensitives who struggle with addictive tendencies This probably plays in a lot because if we're overextended in one area, it makes sense that the pendulum will swing and we will need to find an under somewhere to balance us out. So if we overthink, we're going to hit a point where we go, you know what? Screw it. I can't think anymore. And that might be when we do something impulsive or reckless. We also tend to over explain who's listening right now that resonates with over explaining exhausting and wearing yourself out. So as a tribe, we tend to have a lot of struggles in the over and under department. It's also why a lot of sensitives wonder or have maybe been diagnosed maybe appropriately, maybe inappropriately as bipolar. Because if we have higher highs and we have lower lows as intensely feeling people, to the average way of thinking, that really is going to look kind of bipolar. In my experience, as we learn to balance more in the middle and not go so far into overwhelm, overstimulation, overthinking, as we learn to respect our own boundaries physically and emotionally, as we learn to explain and not overexplain, think and not overthink, a lot of those scary, exhausting extremes take care of themselves because we're practicing, we're reprogramming into more of a balanced way of being internally and externally. And that's a good practice because if you are bipolar, that's going to be part of the practice anyway. So these are just good things for us to know as feely people who walk the planet. Number five, we tend to be the hardest on ourselves, way too hard. We expect perfection, but a lot of us are crafty about that perfectionistic part of ourselves. We somehow know how to make it sound reasonable when we're actually putting pretty cruel pressure, shaming, never good enough on ourselves. And that can show up in very nuanced ways. It's not just for the biggies like, oh, I'm interviewing for a job and I'm putting pressure on myself and I'm anxious. It's not just for the big life things. Like if you're about to give birth to a baby or become a parent for the first time or buy your own your first home. This kind of hard perfectionism shows up in the day to day. Like if you have to pick out an outfit for a date or for work, it'll sound like I need to just find the right outfit. That's all I'm trying to do. I just want to find the right one. Doesn't sound like there's anything wrong with that. But guess what? There is no right outfit. There's the outfit that you pick and by picking it you make it right. 
but there is no exact right outfit. So very often when I'm in sessions with people, I ask people, hey, if someone else was going through what you're going through, what would you say to them? And all of a sudden this patient kindness washes over. But when they were in the self, it was a lot of I should be further than where I am. The thing that I'm doing is not good enough. What's wrong with me that I'm not further along or have this better sorted and figured out? Things that we would never tell other people, but we seem to tell ourselves with ease. No matter how sucky those messages feel, we seem to just glaze over it because it's so normalized, especially if we came from a critical upbringing. Number six, traumatic childhoods and PTSD. Now, why is this? Well, trauma makes us more sensitive. So it becomes this chicken or the egg thing, right? I can't really tell you for sure if I was born a highly sensitive empath or if I was made. Now, I have a hunch that I was born ready for sensitivity, that I was put into this planet with a calling and that sensitivity was a part of me finding that calling, growing into who I am. But the truth is, I almost died when I was born, and I was born into a very chaotic childhood with very angry and bitter, low maturity, low empathy parents. I was highly stressed most of my development. It is very true, and I have to own it. It is my reality. It is part of my story that no doubt That made me hypervigilant as a child. It made me more observant. It made me hyper aware. I talked about the over and under a minute ago. Hyper awareness is an over. Hyper stimulation is an over. We're learning in our healing how to just observe, how to be vigilant in taking care of ourselves, but not hyper vigilant. So we are learning to balance as a tribe. It is often because of some of this traumatic childhood experience that many of us have that we also wonder if we ourselves are narcissistic. And often that's because we were raised with someone who had narcissistic traits. So we may have learned some patterns or some ways of being, but if we're questioning that narcissism and if we're seeing something in ourselves that we don't like, that we want to change, something that frightens us, That is an expression of insight, of accountability, of personal ownership. And those are things that are markedly the opposite of narcissism. Number seven, we tend to be the people on the planet described as old souls. Do you identify as an old soul? Have you been described as an old soul since you were a small child? And the real interesting thing here is that we can be an old soul. You feel that coming from me, I'm sure, if you listen to the show. But we can very oppositely be very connected to our inner child. As we age, we also know that it's the old souls who tend to value play and that that very much helps us walk towards our elderly years with more sanity and more joy. Because playfulness is a very important, undervalued part of being a well-rounded, healthy human being. So we tend to be the old souls. So if you think in your world about some people that maybe you have identified as some old soul energy, I wonder if they're highly sensitive too. Number eight, we tend to have inner child issues Because of our old soulness that we're born with, the adults around us, whether we're in a more functional household or a more dysfunctional household, tend to naturally, through no fault of their own, expect us to be more mature and more responsible. Now, the problem comes in when we're not asked to be mature, responsible in small little bites, little nuggets. And what can happen is this slippery slope effect where old soul children, because it's so useful to a parent who has multiple children especially, 
can really wind up in a position where they are accidentally expected to be responsible all the time. And this robs us of that carefree quality that is a natural childhood. That's the the magic of sitting with a toddler, right? If you've ever hung out with a toddler or a very small child, they're not stressing about how they look. They don't have anxiety like that. They're very present. And if a worm crosses the sidewalk, they're going to stop and watch that worm with awe. It's because they don't feel a responsibility to show up or to do or to take care of that they can stop and be in pure awe and wonder. So when we haven't gotten enough pure awe and wonder in our childhoods, in my opinion, we have some inner child issues to work through because it's too much expectation. So if that's part of your story, know that inner child work can really help you to soften your edges to flow with more ease and to learn how to laugh in the face of what's hard instead of feel triggered and tense in the body in the face of what's hard. Number nine, we tend to really love people but also prefer animals over people if we're really, really honest and feel safe enough to be that honest. And then in a way that can confuse a lot of us, As loving and as empathic as we can be towards people, we also cannot stand people. Isn't that interesting? It's it's a sort of conundrum that we have to work out and make peace with within ourselves. In this way, we are complex creatures. And we really give ourselves hell if we walk around with the expectation that we should be more simple or more singular in our thinking. We have to learn how to hold space for all that we are and not expect ourselves to be pigeonholed in any one way. So I am here to tell you that it is absolutely natural as a highly sensitive person to have a deep love for humanity and also want to strangle it a little bit, to both want to be surrounded by people and have a strong, big community and also go live in a cave and never see anyone ever again. We don't have to fight these aspects of ourselves. We can learn to listen and to balance these aspects. And when there's a part of me that is saying, Nikki, man, that cave is looking good. I've learned to recognize that for what it is. It's an invitation that I probably need a little bit of alone time, a little less peopling just to recharge, to restore my introverted parts. Number 10. We tend to be judgmental. And as we heal, the sort of harsh judgment starts to melt and become discernment. And if we are childhood abuse survivors, we really need discernment, you guys. We need permission within ourselves to discern. Does this feel like a safe person or an unsafe person? Is this someone worth my effort and my time? Are they offering me some reciprocity or is this an energy vampire? Can you hear it when I describe in that way that that's different than judging the energy vampire? Judgment is what's wrong with this person. This person is shitty. Like those are judgments. Discernment is, ooh, I recognize this vibe here. I've seen this before. Where would I like to place myself in relation to this particular vibe or this particular element. At that point, discernment is self-care. If we come from critical family of origin, this is going to be some necessary work because we must make peace and detox what we were taught as negative, very low vibe judgment to be able to lean in and give permission to practice discernment and grow into what that means and how that feels as we heal, grow, develop, and evolve. As an HSP tribe, something that I have come to recognize as many of us having in common, is that if we have something on our calendar, let's say it's 10 a.m. in the morning, and all you have on your calendar is something at 4 p.m., we tend to feel the weight of that upcoming event within the day or within our week or within our month or even longer. There's a real looming 
That's the best word that I can put to this dynamic that I'm trying to name for you. That we feel events loom. We feel the potential suck of energy before it even happens. Now, what that's a sign of is not having emotional boundaries. Once I had enough, because we'll never do it perfectly, you guys. But once I had enough understanding of, okay, I really need to have some boundaries. I get to have boundaries. I understand what a boundary is internally inside of me. And then I understand the limits of a boundary If I share the boundary that I want with another human being, because that other human being won't necessarily respect the boundary that I'm laying out. So once I understood enough to understand some major boundaries work in my life, this magical thing started to happen. I didn't feel the weight of impending events on my psyche, on my heart, on my spirit, and on my energy. Now, why is that? Well, the more that we invite, practice, and own boundaries, the more boundary we become in ways that we can't even really intend or know. So what I was feeling there was the development of a boundary around my time. Before I could boundary off the time and just be present where I was at 10 a.m., I was holding what was going to happen at 4 p.m. And the next day, holding all of what was coming. There's that old quote about, you are not Atlas carrying the world on your shoulders. You know the statue where the guy is holding the world? You are not Atlas carrying the world on your shoulders. The world is carrying you. And when we have some semblance of boundaries, we start to feel the reality of that quote. Now I can move through my day, my week, and my calendar just doing what I'm doing in the moment. And the heavy weightedness of what was impending as if it had doom music playing behind it, that no longer happens. And I can say with a whole lot of confidence that when you engage the work that I talk about here on the show, that that happens for many, 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 many people. This is a big part of why I'm so passionate about boundaries, because there is no limit to how boundaries work will show up for you in your life. So here's another over that I didn't put in the the over number. So this is number 12. We are overly loyal kind of makes sense with what I've already described, right? If we're people pleasing and codependent, if we have a strong work ethic, it's not easy for us to quit. So if we're at a dysfunctional job or in a relationship that no longer serves us or we recognize as not something we want to continue, this over loyalty will really give us hell. So we want to learn how to be more loyal to ourselves than outwardly loyal. When we are loyal to ourselves, We no longer have to be scared about being overly loyal or overly attached to others because our attachment, our security is with ourselves. 13, we absorb when we would benefit from observing. We are confused until we aren't about what is our own emotion and what is someone else's, what is our responsibility and what is theirs. And as we move through more of our healing path and learn those boundaries and learn what to do and how to be the art form of communication where we overlap, that's when we really start to feel more secure in who we are and when moving through the world takes less energy than it did before. I promise you that there is a world available where you're not so confused about what somebody else's emotion is and if it's yours or not clarity there is available and know that you are not alone we can learn how to observe instead of absorb 14 we are seekers we are on a journey to understand intuition over anxiety almost every sensitive i have ever met not just the ones that show up to work with me but the ones that i have met in my real life, just in the random way that we meet people. Our anxiety has been such a part of our lives, 
in my belief, often because we're surrounded by people who don't seem to have an appropriate anxiety. Not all anxiety is dysfunctional. But when we have had over anxiety, it has overridden our intuition. So we have been confused for a lifetime about what is our intuitive knowing versus anxious story. 15. Our environment is more important than we tend to realize as highly sensitive people. And this one is a struggle because if we are in survival mode, the last thing we are thinking about doing is putting energy into making a cozy environment. That does not make sense if we are surviving. So if you are currently surviving, if you are having a lot of struggle, if you have maybe lost your home or lost your apartment due to COVID, know that we can do this in very small, reasonable ways. That can be one little token, something, a little note that you write on a sticky pad on a post-it note. That just says, you are worthy. I am worthy. We need little things in our environment, messages, things that make us feel warm, cozy, comforted. In the way that an animal is probably going to feel more comfortable within a forest and within a city because that is the environment where it is meant to be. As sensitive people who can get overly stimulated, we do well to put some energy into soothing our environment, whatever that environment is right now. 16. We judge ourselves as weird or wrong based on the perceptions of others. There's a lesson in my boundaries course about this, about how important it is to learn to light up for ourselves. Because we are naturally observant, we have grown up watching how people respond to us. So if someone smirks or frowns or has a little bit of eye roll energy, we have learned to absorb that and then judge ourselves. So can you see how observing instead of absorbing can really help us here? Because it's very different for me to observe Ooh, somebody made a weird face or someone just didn't like what I said and observe that instead of see that, sense it and get small within and start a story of, oh, that was stupid. Why did I say that? What's wrong with me? He thinks I'm a moron now. So we judge ourselves as weird or wrong based on the perceptions of others. Now, some of that is natural. We're supposed to grow up and turn to our parents, go, is what I'm doing okay? And have them go, yes, this is okay. Or no, you know what? I think this would be better. Come here, let me tie your shoes so that you can go run and play. Now you're ready, go ahead. So if we grew up with a critical parent, we just absorbed way too much criticism about who we are, about how we are. So what would happen if you either embraced weird and let yourself know, yep, I'm just as weird as Nikki is and everybody that listens to her show, or accepted, I'm just fine, just the way that I am. There's nothing wrong about how I am, about who I am, about how I'm made and how I sense and how I feel and what I think. I don't have to buy in so much to how others perceive me. It's okay for others to see me as weird and for me to be okay with that. There's nothing that I have to change about myself or fix if someone else has a negative or weird perception of me. 17, creatives tend to feel unfulfilled if we aren't creating something. HSPs, we are creative. And some of you are scratching your head right now. Some of you are like, I don't know. I don't know. I haven't really created a whole lot. There's no room for creation while we are surviving. But our spirit is that of creative beings. So as you heal, as you find more groundedness in this life, as you learn to observe instead of absorb, 
my hunch is that you will find some very specific ways to express creatively. That can be drawing. It can be all kinds of different things. It can be riding a horse. It can be creating a story while you walk. It can be literally anything. Cooking. Mowing the grass. You're creating a landscape in your yard. But we have a creative spirit and most of us find a way as we heal and walk our path to express it. This is fun. This is the embodiment of thriving instead of surviving. So sometimes we lean into creativity to teach our survival parts. Hey, guess what? You don't have to survive this moment. Look, I'm creating. 18, we tend to be conflict adverse. Now, some of us who are really strong and have found our voices go, I don't know, I've got a big mouth, I can say some things. But I find that even that type can sometimes be conflict adverse. Where for the real vulnerable things, the intimate things, the things that make us feel sheepish and tender that we're not so confident about, we can still avoid the real conflict that we're facing. And that makes sense. Nobody ever got a conflict class, right? And most of us have seen really poor examples of handling conflict throughout the course of our lives. So we can learn how to do conflict with increasing grace, with increasing groundedness, with increasing self-respect. And we can do that work while we continue to pick our battles. It is smart to avoid some conflict. It really, really is. But we can't avoid it all. And we can strengthen these muscles. 19, we tend to have the gift of prophecy or perception. We don't know why. And we can't tell you exactly what we saw or sensed to know the things that we know. But we can feel and sense what's coming. Often that sets up some struggle especially when we don't consciously know this about ourselves because we can project that onto other people and be very frustrated when other people don't seem to see what's coming or if they discount because they don't have the gift of prophecy and they discount that we do. So often we have experiences with people where people can be very surprised that something that we said is coming or would happen happens. How did you know that? I sensed it. So the older that we get, the more that we put down anxiety and hear and sense our intuition with more clarity, the more we might experience the gift of prophecy or perception. 20. I meet lots of sensitive people who have a blunt sense of humor. And this is going to be surprising. I think we get offended less. Why is that? Well, we're sensitive. It seems like we would get offended more if we're highly sensitive, right? I think there's a paradox at play here. I think we are the people on the planet who we can feel intention. So even if someone says something, bad choice of words to me, they really stick their foot in their mouth. If I can feel that there's an absence of any viciousness, if I can feel that that person has a light heart in that interaction with me, even if it's the worst possible thing I could think of to say, I am likely to not get offended, to give lots of grace and to just flow over that and move on. If you find yourself getting very, very, very offended, is it because you're paying more attention to words than intention? The other thing that we can sense is, is somebody really insecure? Sometimes really insecure people, they just fumble and put their foot in their mouth a lot. Sometimes people just don't know what to say and say the exact wrong thing as they try to say something that's good or fair or reasonable or fits the situation. I really love the blunt senses of humor and sometimes the dark senses of humor that my highly observant, highly sensitive people have. 21, we tend to be narcissist magnets. 
the very first podcast I ever did, the one that I went, ooh, maybe I could have my own podcast, was the Highly Sensitive Person podcast with Kelly. If you want to go back and listen to that, I believe I am episode 65 of the Highly Sensitive Person podcast. You'll hear how green I am on the microphone. But on that podcast, I discussed with Kelly how we fit as highly sensitive people with narcissists just like puzzle pieces, low empathy to high empathy. It's as if narcissists can smell us. If they are energy vampires, we have the sweetest blood. Why? We're very often people pleasers and overly conscientious. So we tend to give a lot of space to the bad behavior of a narcissist. We tend to allow them for fear of us being rude or scapegoated. We tend to let them get away with a lot, even while we sense something is wrong here. Another reason I am passionate about boundaries. I don't think the world is going to stop growing narcissists. In fact, we have evidence, research is happening right now, that is saying we are growing more and more people with personality disorder traits. We are in the time of social media, y'all. Narcissism is certainly, certainly growing. So we can learn some very strong, very healthy, very simple boundaries. And once we know that we don't have to take it personally, it's not something wrong that you're doing. It really is this quality of they can smell me. My blood is tasty. Of course, they want to drink from me. Once we understand that, own it and work with it. I am proud to say I am no longer attracting narcissists. And I love being able to watch my clients have similar realizations because we can learn how to repel them too. All right, two more guys. 22, we tend to feel lonely, a deep and existential loneliness. And interestingly, most of my HSPs will admit to me, most of the friendships that they have were very instant connections that we tripped over each other somewhere along the path and just clicked. Our struggle with our loneliness is the space between those clicking moments. We tend to scare ourselves when we hit a lonely patch. It tends to kick us when we're lonely in all of our low self-worth struggles. Everything a narcissist has ever told us, whether it was a parent or a partner, somebody we dated, we let the fear bubble up and question, what if they were right? What if something really is wrong with me? Then we go into feeling weird because we're different than 80 to 85% of the population. When we really do our inner child work, one of the benefits is that we don't struggle with loneliness. If we do, it is a wave. It's a moment. It's not years. It's not decades. Because when we really internalize and own, my inner child will never be alone again. She always has me. We no longer wind up feeding the lonely gremlins. What happens if you trust more of that magic of instant connection that can happen that I know has happened to you before? What if we trust that more than the lonely gremlins that can start to whisper? 23, we give people a lot of rope. We hold a lot of space for people. We tend to lead with giving the benefit of the doubt. And then we tend to get really pissed off, angry, bitter, even resentful. When we see that person just taking that rope and running with it. And so a lot of us give way too much space and hit a point of, I can't do this anymore. I'm done. And when we hit a done point as highly sensitive people, it can be like slamming a 10-ton door never to be opened again. The more that we balance in all the ways that I named today, the more that we come to center, the more that we understand who we are, how we move through the world, what will serve us and what will tank us, and we stop doing the things that invite tanking ourselves, we no longer have to get fed up with people in such a way. We can still close doors, but it takes a lot of energy to slam a 10-ton door and then to process all the things that happened that made us slam the 10-ton door. 
we learn as we heal to give people one chance, then two, and then to take action the third time. Second chances were always meant to be second chances, y'all, not infinite chances. That is my list. And if you resonated with much on this list, I really invite you into the boundaries course. Registration is open. And if you are ready to own your choices and own your healing and to do the real boundaries work within yourself, to give yourself the foundation so that you can functionally set boundaries that work so that you can nurture your life and your relationships. I want you there if you are ready. It's like a big online classroom. I teach 14 live webinars throughout the six weeks. You're not required to be there in live time, though many of you will be. You get the course material for an entire year. You can work on that with your therapist. If you work with me, you can work on that with me. We're going to meet for the live webinars each Monday and Wednesday once the course opens at 6 p.m. Mountain Time. And on Fridays, we're going to meet at 2 p.m. Mountain Time. The last two weeks of the course, we meet once a week on a Monday evening to review. So there's plenty of time for me to review, answer your questions. I actively teach in there for six weeks. Then I leave the course and leave the material to the students. I read all the comments that y'all write as you work through the course And you get to interact with me if you come to those live webinars. You can ask questions. You can ask for clarification. And I share a lot of my personal story and my personal journey. It is my favorite thing that I do all year. I am passionate about breaking down boundaries so that you can leave that course fully understanding what you're working on and what you need to practice. Don't believe anyone who tries to sell you that you can do a boundaries course and be some kind of boundaries perfectionist. The world is going to constantly challenge us and every situation is different. My boundaries course, I believe, is the foundation that you need to be able to move through all the ways that life is going to challenge you so that you can meet that challenge with more peace, more security, more groundedness, and more inner knowing and intuitive connection than you ever have had before in your life. You don't hear me give a lot of testimonials, though I could give them, I get them, because that's just a form of propaganda. And I don't want to like push that. I want you to join this course because you resonate with my work and you have a sense that there is something for you to learn from me and with me on the journey. I relish the opportunity to spend six weeks with you in an intensive boundary space. And when I say intensive, it's about the six weeks. All you're required to do, because I'm all about teaching you with ease, right? All you have to really do is show up in that course, run your eyeballs over the material, and then listen to the webinar. This is material that you just have to sit with and let it marinate. And then maybe go back and listen to the webinar again throughout the year. And when something comes up in your life, you can go, oh, I know what lesson that is in the boundaries course and go pull it up so that you can actively practice There are payment plans so that almost anyone can afford coming into this course. I do it with a big group to keep the cost down. I would love to see you if you resonate and if you know that you need to work on boundaries, come join. If you're in the Patreon, find the code in Patreon before you sign up. Our Patreon people always get the best code. If you're not a Patreon member, you can use code earlybird 21 And you'll save $100 off the $450 course, making it $350, or you can choose a payment plan. Light and love, and I hope to see you in October if you're passionate about learning boundaries with me. I know I'm passionate about teaching you. I want to thank some of you who have spent your precious time getting on iTunes and writing a review. It helps work that funky iTunes algorithm, and it helps show other people the show so that they can learn that they're highly sensitive, so that they can heal and grow. I want to thank Megan Lawfer. She says, Nikki, I am beyond grateful I found your podcast. These always make me cry, you guys. My boss was challenging my personality, trying to tell me not to have feelings and talking to me like I was so small and I knew something wasn't right. 
I ended up quitting because of how toxic it was. And I just knew I wasn't crazy in the fact that I was defending my emotions and feelings. I searched podcasts for emotions. Yep, I am having some right now. And I immediately felt connected when I saw the name of your show. Thank you, Megan. And thank you for taking care of yourself and quitting that job. HCS712 says, thank you is not enough. I have never written a review before now. That is quite the honor. Thank you. Thank you. And I am really just overflowing with gratitude for this podcast and your work. I have known since I was a child that I am an HSP and an empath. So to finally find this world of souls who understand and giving the emotions we work through a voice is so grounding to me. You bring me back to my path when I feel I have hit an obstacle and also help to prepare for obstacles I have not yet encountered. So much light and love. Thank you so much for getting on and writing a review. I know that it's helping other people find the show. I'm going to read one more because I've done a long show today. I want to thank Logo17. They say, wow, amazing show. I love the tactical, honest, and real rawness Nikki delivers in this podcast. I hit subscribe and definitely can't wait for the next show. For that listener that is addicted to creating their future, for the listener who knows they are destined for greatness, but didn't believe they could actually change their life from a podcast. Ooh, y'all. I promise you there is so much healing that is available. And I know some of you are having moments when that is very, very hard to believe right now. All you have to do is breathe and put one foot in front of the other. And allow yourself to marinate in what it is to heal. No rushing. No trying to get there any faster than you're moving. The pace that you're moving is okay, even when your feelings tell you otherwise. Light and love. And I hope you know that you are part of a massive tribe on this planet. I will see you right here next time. I'm an emotional badass. You're an emotional badass. And together we are where Moxie meets Mindful. Bye-bye. Mm-hmm.